Hello, everybody, and welcome back after quite some time to Strip Search, the comic strip podcast with me, Pete Chianka, and my partner, as always, Dave London. Hello, Dave. Hey, Pete. Good to be back, isn't it? It is good to be back. I think the last time we had a podcast, I think Pluto was still a planet. <laughs> That's entirely possible. We, um, as, as you may recall, because I believe we talked about it in our last installment, our podcast host got out of the podcast business and we were left uh, somewhat adrift trying to figure out where to take our musings next. And um, Spotify offered us a hundred million. We said, no way. Oh, no. If you don't have Neil Young, you're not having us. We are not doing business with you. Um, so now we have, uh, we are sort of uh, what you might call self-syndicated and uh, distributing our podcast uh, to all the usual spots via a new service and also on our website, petpeepscomic.com. Uh, and we hope to get back into a regular routine of speaking to uh, cartoonists, comics professionals, commentators, critics, uh, you name it, if they have something to do with comics, cartooning, or illustration, we want to talk to them, and uh, you'll be able to hear them uh, here, here, there, and everywhere. How's that sound? That sounds great. So we, we are no longer podless. Exactly. We, we, like every other <laughs> citizen of the United States and the <laughs> world, have a podcast once again. I know <laughs> you were really concerned about that, uh, but now you could go to sleep knowing that we are here for you. Um, and as I mentioned, we continue to do our comic strip, Pet Peeves, um, which is also uh, available on our website, petpeevescomic.com, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We are everywhere um, three times a week. Um, also coming to your inbox, you can sign up now to get the Pet Peeves new newsletter twice a month, uh, which will run down all the comics uh, that you may have missed from us, along with news about this podcast and anything else, uh, such as personal appearances. We have one coming up. Um, Dave, do you want to talk about our uh, engagement this spring? Uh, we, so uh, KidsCon New England, which runs twice a year, once in Portland, Maine, and once in Concord, New Hampshire. So uh, we will be, the next one coming up is uh, in May of 2022 in Concord, New Hampshire. You can uh, learn all about KidsCon New England at uh, kidsconnewengland.com, which is K-I-D-S-C-O-N-N-E.com on the web. Uh, come see us as well as many other wonderful cartoonists and artists and comics professionals and it will be a great time hope to see you there we will be there we'll be selling our wares that's right we have wares <laughs> there uh, we have our two pet peeves collections uh, you can read about those on our website also um, and uh, we're we're well into uh, our material for book three i'd say we're probably about halfway there um Maybe the next one will be in color. Who knows? Might do something special. All right. Something to look forward to. Yeah. Dave, I know you love coloring the, the strips in. Yeah, because it's not like that, you know, takes no time. Right? Yeah. So, what your, it's one of your favorite things. Maybe I can learn how to do that. I can't draw. It's probably it's fun to color, but uh, with electronics, I would do it. I, you know, I don't color by old school. I use, you know, I use um, uh, an app to do it. And you can spend so much time doing it and just get lost in the weeds. What's, what's that quote? Uh, perfection is the enemy of the good or something like that that's right we used that phrase in one of our strips recently um yes perfect is the enemy of the no i don't remember uh, <laughs> of the yes i think perfect is the enemy of the good i think voltaire said that i'm not yes yeah, or, or some neo-nazi i don't know <laughs> um uh which brings us to our uh our very special guest hillary shoot uh who's a distinguished professor of english and Art and Design at Northeastern University. So we're also really going to get into some, some great topics having to do um, with comics history and um, their um, impact on literature in general. Uh, so we're super excited to have her here. We still don't know exactly why she agreed to come on, but we're not going to question it. And uh, unless you have- Question her, that's all. Yes, yes. We're going to put the spotlight on Hillary Shute in just a moment. Uh, anything else before we go to break, Dave? Uh, we just want to thank everyone for uh, staying with us and supporting us. And we want to see you around. Look for our comics uh, online, as Pete said. Come visit us at our events and just uh, keep thinking funny. And on that note, we will be back in one minute with Hillary Shute.
Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Strip Search, the comic strip podcast with Pete Gianca, that's me, and my co-host, Dave London. Hey, hello. And we are very excited to welcome our guest in our latest podcast, um, Hillary Shute, who I'm going to um, introduce. Uh, you might want to relax, because this is a long one. <laughs> Hilary Shute, she is a distinguished professor of English and art and design at Northeastern University right here in Boston. Um, her work focuses on comics and graphic novels, contemporary fiction, visual studies, American literature, gender and sexuality studies, literature and the arts, critical theory, and media studies. She is the author of several books, including Graphic Women, Life Narrative, and Contemporary Comics, Outside the Box, Interviews with Contemporary Cartoonists, Disaster Drawn, Visual Witness, Comics and Documentary Form, and why Comics from Underground to Everywhere, which I am reading right now, and I highly recommend it. Um, her next book is an edited collection from Pantheon called Mouse Now, and welcome Hillary Shute to Strip Search. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, definitely, definitely our pleasure. Um, so uh, this is a, we, we mentioned, we've already mentioned Mouse because it's in the name of your upcoming book, but right. <laughs> um, and that's a, a very pertinent topic. But just before we get into that, I just want to ask, you know, how a, a respectable academic such as yourself <laughs> um, sort of wound up specializing in, in this area of study? Um, well, it's all connected to mouse. So, um, you know, as a kid, um, I loved Garfield. Um, that, that might let you know how old I am. I loved the Garfield everything. I had Garfield stuffed animals. Um, I loved Tintin. I loved Asterix. I loved you know, just sort of comics the way a kid loves comics. Um, but I didn't think ever that I would specialize in comics for a scholarly career until I read Mouse. So I was getting my PhD in English at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, which I absolutely loved. And I was in a contemporary literature class. And for that class, we read novels by Toni Morrison, Don DeLillo, Salman Rushdie, Thomas Pynchon, Doris Lessing, and we read Mouse by Art Spiegelman. And that was in the year 2000. I remember it was fall 2000 because I was writing my paper on Mouse the night of the Bush-Gore election <laughs> disaster. And I would go out of my room into the living room in my apartment in Brooklyn and look at the TV and then go back to my computer in my room and work on my mouse paper. So, um, you know, that was, you know, over 20 years ago, and I was so blown away reading Mouse. Um, I wanted to know how come this text worked so well? Like why comics for this kind of story? And Mouse really opened the door for me because then I went looking for other comics like Mouse and I discovered a whole huge, diverse, fascinating world. Um, you know, I had grown up um, right outside of Harvard Square so I had been going to Milner Picnic, um, my local comic book shop, my whole life. But suddenly I started going there and looking for other things like Mouse. And I think it was when I read work by Joe Sacco um, and when I read work by other people working in nonfiction genres that I realized that I could, you know, make a career out of thinking and writing about this kind of stuff. That's amazing. I mean, we, I, I should, Shout out right now. Dave and I both went to Tufts um, and I should shout out to our uh, one of our uh, favorite literature professors, Jonathan Wilson, who was uh, just retired. He was the um, English department chair for a while, actually, before he retired and he assigned Mouse. So this was in the late 80s. It hadn't been out. I, in fact, I don't think the second volume had been collected yet. Yeah. And, and I, I remember having similar feelings. And I, I think I read it we took um, alternative fiction with him, but I think he assigned it. I also took a Holocaust literature. He may have assigned it both. Yeah. Uh, and it really- He also assigned us Pynchon, just, just for the record. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So another class with Pynchon right. and Spiegelman on the syllabus, like right, mine, right. yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I definitely understand how, how it could have that effect. And that sort of brings us into, you know, it, it's back in the public conversation now after some years um, of, of not necessarily being so, not for a great reason though, because the school district in Tennessee, um, call it a ban, call it a curriculum choice, call it what you will, but they uh, had some um, uh, interesting arguments for not allowing their students to access that book. Um, and it obviously it created a lot of headlines, it created a lot of sales of the book, it went right back up onto the bestseller yeah. list. 
Um, and I saw an interview with Spiegelman who said he, he read the uh, minutes of that meeting and he realized the problem was quote, bigger and stupider than he had first assumed. Yep. <laughs> so I thought I'd ask you your take on the controversy and on his reaction to it. Yes, okay. So, I mean, I think, so, okay. You mentioned this before. Um, I'm publishing a book with the title Mouse Now that's slated to come out um, in November, 2022. So even before the ban in the Tennessee school district. Um, I was thinking about Mouse as a profoundly sticky text, like a text that causes a lot of strong feelings all around. And a, a, a deeply, enduringly relevant text because it is an anti-fascist text. Um, and, you know, I, I think one of the things that's really interesting is that for a long time, Spiegelman himself resisted, I mean, for decades, um, the categorization of this book as a Jewish book. We worked together on a book called Meta Mouse about making mouse. Um, so that came out from Pantheon in 2011. So I was lucky enough to work on this book called Meta Mouse for five or six years with art. And I interviewed him for two years for this book. I would just go over to his studio and we would sit and talk and smoke cigarettes and then get the um, tapes professionally transcribed. And then I edited that down for Meta Mouse. In any case, he talked to me about how resistant he was to thinking about the book as a Jewish book. Although it's all about Jews, it's all about Judaism, um, you know, in his father's sense of Judaism and in his you know, um, second generation sense of what it means to be Jewish, but he didn't want it to be pigeonholed as Jewish. And I can understand that. However, after the deadly Charlottesville rally, um, after the fatal um, terrorist act with um, people being shot at the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh, Spiegelman started giving talks that he called Mouse Now in which essentially for the first time in decades, he embraced the book as a Jewish book. And specifically the kinds of possibilities that the book holds out to be a, te a text that's um, resistant and anti-fascist. And I thought that was so, so interesting. So I borrowed his title, Mouse Now, which he started using as a talk title for his lectures that he gives you know, all over the world for this book. So, you know, I think one of the things about Mouse is that it diagrams Vladek Spiegelman's experiences so closely as a Jew in Poland in the late 30s and early 40s that we can watch the fascist machinery happen. And in some ways, I think it can even be viewed as a kind of handbook for fascism in how closely it attends to details. So I was totally, utterly blown away when Mouse appeared in a cameo on The Handmaid's Tale in 2018. Um, you know, I was lying in bed watching The Handmaid's Tale and I started screaming when I saw Mouse on the screen. So there's this weird moment in which um, uh, an enslaver in this theocratic near future society um, that we see in the show through Massachusetts. <laughs> it's located in Massachusetts. Um, he, he owns Mouse and an enslaved woman risks having her finger chopped off to look at a page of Mouse. And I thought, what is Mouse? This um, was published in 1986, this book that she's looking at, doing on The Handmaid's Tale on this, you know, uh, like science fiction, future dystopia TV show. And I was talking to Art about it and he was saying maybe it's because in some ways people could interpret it as a playbook for fascism because it attends to detail that closely. On the other hand, what it does is it particularizes humans. Um, and it shows us not just you know, masses of people who are killed, but it tells us about their families, about their names, about their experiences. And in that way, in individuating victims. I think it's a text that's trying to resist the fascist impulse and it's showing us how it works in order to push back very, very strongly against it. So all of that is a long way of saying, um, 
I was surprised because it's so ridiculous and the reasons given were so specious. But in some ways I wasn't surprised because Mouse has always been a lightning rod. I think part of the reason it's always been a lightning rod and part of the reason it was targeted um, you know, last week is because its central suggestion is that the past isn't past. Visually, we see moments from the 1940s and moments from the 1970s and 80s collide in Mouse. Like the famous scene in the book in which Spiegelman draws himself drawing the page we read in his studio in Soho in the 1980s on, on top of a pile of dead bodies from a death camp um, in Poland, you know, dur during the Holocaust. So I can see why that would be an argument that is terrifying to people who want to deny, you know, that history happened the way it happened. And so in some ways, um, I wasn't surprised. And, you know, but it's far from the first book to sort of go into those details when it comes to the Holocaust, but the format, the graphic novel format and the way he um, uses, um, you know, sort of these visual allegories, you know, that, do you think that makes it a particular target um, when it comes to people who don't want their kids to see it, you know, or don't want it, don't want it out there? Yes, and I think um, the graphic has everything to do with it. So um, thank, thank you for bringing me back around to that. So, you know, I read the minutes too of the school board and someone um, who was arguing to ban the book said, you know, this book shows images of people hanging. Do we want to promote that? And I thought that was such a telling comment because the book is not in any way promoting the violence that it chronicles. It's not suggesting that people go out and hang other people. What it's doing is it's acknowledging the horrors of history and it's suggesting that those horrors are not that far in the past. And in fact, they may loom in front of us in the present. So I think images like um, the image that we see in The Handmaid's Tale, which is an image of um, Jews who are depicted as mice who were hung on a public street in a city in Poland for dealing on the black market, are really, really powerful images. Um, Spiegelman doesn't shy away from the spectacular aspect of those images. You know, the images of the mice hanging, um, those images are large. On, on a page of the book. Um, it's a very, very striking um, and very upsetting image. But it's not there in order to sensationalize what happened. It's there in order to allow the reader to confront the facts of history. And like I said before, what I think is so interesting about what Mouse does is we see these men hanging, but then we, we see these sort of literal footnotes at the bottom of the page below their hanging feet in midair, and we learn their names, and we learn about their jobs, and we learn about their families. And it's that kind of way that comics can convey information with words and images and the way they work together that I think makes Mouse such a, such a powerful work. No, I, yeah, I definitely agree. Um, Dave, did you wanna... Uh, yeah, if I, if I can jump in, Hillary. So um, it, Spiegelman, I'm just going to read the quote to make sure I get it right. He talks about the secret language of comics. And you, uh, in your book, talk about the importance of what happens between the panels. Yeah. So, so if you can, so for some of our listeners who may not be as familiar with the graphic novel format or, or new to it and, and new to the, uh, or, 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 you know, learning about um, the literature in your experience, can you talk a little bit about those quotes? Absolutely. Um, so I'm so glad you picked up on this um, idea that Spiegelman has talked about and that people like Scott McCloud have also talked about, about the so-called secret language of comics. So to me, um, part of the secret language of comics has to do with what gets left out. Because um, I think as, as um, anyone, including the two of you who, you know, is involved in, in making comics would know, um, so much work goes into deciding what to present and what to leave out. 
it's not just an art form where you just show everything, right? You decide selectively what to show and you figure out the kind of beats of time and space that make the story work for the reader. And so Scott McCloud has this great line. I mean, he's talking specifically about this idea of the secret language of comics. And he says that comics is a subtractive medium. And then he says it's secret because no one picks a comic book up off the stands and gasps in admiration at all the panels that were left out, <laughs> which I think is really funny. It's sort of like the secret labor of the cartoonist and he made this funny joke that he thinks that comics is secret labor in the aesthetic diaspora. And he was just, you know, joking, but joking about how labor intensive it is to do that work of deciding what to leave out and deciding what to show and thinking about the reader and the reader's experience and what the reader can deduce from what's there on the page and what the reader sort of needs to encounter as an image. Right. So, I mean, to me, this is the most important part of comics reading and part of the great pleasure of comics is that comics isn't as directive in my thinking as other art forms. Um, it's giving you the space between panels in which, you know, sometimes the amount of time that elapses between panels is marked out for us. Like I can think of a page from Alison Bechtel's Fun Home where she's talking on the phone to her mother and her mother is revealing really heavy um, information about her father being gay. And, you know, there's a panel of her lying on the floor talking on the phone to her mother. And then it says in the next panel, a week later, <laughs> she filled me in. So sometimes the cartoonist tells you how much time is supposed to have elapsed, but sometimes it's completely up to the reader to figure out how much time happens in that, in that gutter space, as I think of it, um, between the panels. You know, is it a minute? Is it a day? Is it a week? Um, is it no time at all? Is it backwards time? You know, there are all sorts of ways, as you know, that cartoonists can experiment with the idea of time on the page. To, to get back to a little bit um, more of sort of how comics, and I think, uh, you know, in, in, your, in, in the book, Why Comics, you know, it, it deals with the fact that, you know, they've become so mainstream in, in so many ways. They've become so much more a part of our lives and so much more the part of the lives of adults that you know historically in America in particular was thought of as sort of a kid's art form and and that has that has really changed uh, to the point where there's a lot of you know these days there's a lot of mainstream adult graphic novels and that you know they they're um, you know sort of aimed at a more mature sensibility whereas prior to this you know you had the underground comics which was a, a different uh, you know, sort of a different animal than what you'd consider a, a, a mainstream graphic novel today. And I think I, I had read a comment by you that you had sort of discovered those at underground comics as a kid and had no idea what you, <laughs> what you were looking at. No, no idea. So I have older sisters who are 10 and 11 years older and an older brother who's 16 years older. So um, they had a lot of underground comics. I remember my sister's copies of the fabulous furry freak brothers. Um, and I was, it was like a magical universe to me, but you know, the Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers, it's all about taking drugs. I had no idea what was really happening, but I knew just from looking at the comic book that it was something illicit and adult, and I was fascinated. <laughs> I wanted to read more. <laughs> um, just the way I felt when I discovered literally a moldering pile of EC horror comics in a chest in a family barn. It was like the biggest jackpot ever. It was so terrifying. And I knew right away how, how totally terrifying it would be, right? Like these sort of illicit adult, violent, drug-taking comics. I, I, I was enchanted from an early age. <laughs> I, I'm picturing the crate in Creepshow. Yeah, I mean, it looked like that. It looks like that in, in the corner of a barn, of an old barn. That's so funny because I think the only place, you know, I was a kid in the 70s um, and I think the only place I saw those comics were in the woods. Left. Yeah, in, right, uh, right. You know, yeah. I, I don't know who put them there or how they got there, but kids would find them in the woods and they'd be, they'd be all ripped up. They'd be individual pages. Oh like, my gosh, that, that's amazing. I mean, that reminds me of, a, of something that Linda Berry once said, which I thought was so funny, um, which is that she knew another person for whom Robert Crumb's Zap Comics were so freaky that he literally buried them in the backyard. 
Um, that, that's, that's interesting. I think Dave has has a Robert Crumb story. I, I knew you were going to bring this up. So would, would Pete refer? You remember the movie Crumb? Did you? See oh yeah, it? I've seen it many times. All right, so it's it's. I don't know if you'd agree with me, but I, it was somewhat of a disturbing movie. I guess would be. Oh, yeah. Movie. Yeah. So I, I took a date to the movie. Uh, somebody who I dated. Nice one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Right. It's like you know, perfect date movie. So we, we we we. She never you know wanted to be near me after that. So that was, <laughs> you know, complete breakup unintentionally. I didn't realize how disturbing it was going to be. So, but it caused a breakup. Yeah. I mean, right. It's like it's like the quintessential bad date movie because it's a movie about a creep. <laughs> Right. You know, a total complete creep, a brilliant creep, but a creep nonetheless. You know, of course, I was like, a cartoon, a movie about a cartoonist, this will be great. You know, yep. it, it wasn't yep. Jim Davis. So, you know, it's also not a short film. No. I love this film. And I, I actually, even though I know it's coming, I, I cry a lot at the end after the title card about Charles Crumb committing suicide. Like it always just hits me. Um, but yeah, it's a long movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a good date movie for many reasons. <laughs> yeah. you, you had met, you've met him. Had, had you worked with him? Um, yes, I have met him a couple of times. So I actually went and I stayed at his house in France um, in 2009. And the reason I went there is because I was interviewing his wife, Aileen Kaminsky Crumb, um, for my book, Graphic Women. And so she invited me to come to their house in um, in Southeast France and to stay with them and to visit her in her studio and to talk to her over a series of days. And I was of course, totally thrilled. And so I sort of got, got Robert Crumb on the side, but they were both really tickled to have me there because I think I was the only person who had ever shown up at their doorstep for her and not for him. And I have to say, you know, um, he's gotten a lot of blowback for a lot of reasons. Um, having to do with sexism, but in my experience of him, he's always been really supportive of his wife's work, which is substantially less well known, and also of women's work in general. Um, so he's been a, a big supporter of lesser known work by female cartoonists. And um, I just loved having dinner with him. You know, we would have these sort of um, very wholesome meals. I remember um, Aileen making roasted chicken, and we had chocolate cake for dessert. And Robert Crumb was literally drinking a big, tall glass of milk with dinner. <laughs> very wholesome. Very, very, very wholesome. Um, so yeah, um, and his daughter came by and she was pregnant at the time. And so the whole vibe from them was very much a wholesome family vibe by the time I visited them in, in 2009. Um, do, do you think, um just for, for people who maybe are intrigued by the idea of reading some of these graphic novels um, and, you know, maybe they've even read Mouse or, or some of the better known ones, um, what would you recommend for somebody who, who is trying to sort of dip into this world um, but doesn't necessarily know where to start? Well, um, I, I mean, I think now, as you were maybe indicating, is a great moment to engage with Mouse if you haven't already, because I think it is so connected to current debates about history and politics. Um, I also, of course, um, am a huge, huge, huge fan of Alison Bechtel's graphic memoir, Fun Home. Um, you know, this is one of the best books I've ever read in my entire life. Um, I won't talk too much about my dissertation, which I know is like the most deathly boring thing that anyone can ever talk about. But I should say, I did this dissertation about nonfiction comics and I defended it in 2006. And then Alison Bechtel's Fun Home comes out in June of 2006, right after I had defended my dissertation. So um, it wasn't a book that was on my radar when I got interested in being a scholar of comics. But as soon as I saw three panels from it, it had a kind of magical feeling for me that has never gone away. And I feel that way about Mouse too. Um, you know, as I was mentioning, I first got interested in Mouse in 2020. Um, so over two decades ago, and it hasn't um, ever seemed boring to me. Every time I read it, I find something new. I mean, it hasn't sort of like expended its value for me ever. It's a text that keeps on giving. And I feel that way about Fun Home also. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm teaching it next week in one of my classes at Northeastern and I'm so thrilled to be teaching it. 
Um, and so those are two really, really wonderful books. Um, one book that I think um, feels very relevant right now and is a, an, a fictional work, unlike Mouse and Fun Home, is the cartoonist Charles Burns's book, Black Hole. So I'm teaching Black Hole this term in a class I'm teaching about comics and COVID. So um, Black Hole is a book about a fictional STD that um, is making its way around the teenaged population um, uh, of, of kids outside of Seattle in the 1970s. And it's an incredibly creepy fictional, I should say again, um, STD it, um, that affects each person who gets it differently. So um, the way it happens is that people grow tails. One character grows an additional mouth on his neck that talks uncontrollably and he can't get it to be quiet. It's this kind of amazing, deeply freaky, deeply beautifully drawn book about being marked and stigmatized by illness, you know, by a virus, um, by something that you, you got and you can't hide. So to me, it's a book that has a lot to do with COVID and all of the shame and the stigma attached to being sick, even to wearing a mask among some um, portions of the population. So to me, it's an incredibly powerful work right now that literalizes that idea of feeling marked by being sick into this creepy, terrifying thing that you can't get off your body, which is the way the STD materializes in the book. Um, I hope I haven't um, made this book sound too horrifying. It's also in many ways, um, a deeply moving book about teenagers um, supporting each other, um, teenagers who are outcasts, um, teenagers being in love, um, people being resilient in the face of hard circumstances. So um, there's a lot in the book that's hopeful too. And Charles Burns um, is one of the most incredible um, draftsmen I've ever met in the comics world, you know, up there with people like Crumb. So it's just a very, very, very visually beautiful book, even if the subject um, is a little bit gross, <laughs> for lack of a better term. <laughs> and complete uh, trivial aside, he was is considered the um, namesake for Mr. Burns of The Simpsons. Isn't that yes. Okay. So I'm so glad that you brought this up. So, um, <laughs> So many cartoonists went to the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. So Charles Burns was there, Matt Groening was there, of course, the creator of The Simpsons, and Linda Berry was there, and they were all there in overlapping years. So I feel like, you know, there was something in the water out there in Olympia, Washington, really, yeah. you know, in the late 70s that created this amazing um, group of cartoonists. So uh, I'm going to go for a different tack, different question. Um, you mentioned earlier in the podcast, even though we've been talking a lot about the American cartoonist, Crumb and so on, uh, you talked about uh, Tintin and Asterisks, um, which are obviously very famous uh, cartoons uh, from other countries. So in the, in the pantheon world of literature, where do comics fit? And do is there a difference between the comics that we think of as the American comic pantheon and the overseas comic pantheon? Where do you find that those fit comparatively? Um, that's such an interesting question. So I think it's really interesting. Um, you mentioned the Franco-Belgian context, um, which is the context that gives us Tintin and um, Asterix. Um, so that's obviously been a really important context for thinking about the cultural value of comics for years and years, because even sort of non-comics people grew up reading those comics or love those comics and sort of acknowledge how important they are, even if they're complicated. Um, the French tradition, I think, is up there with the American tradition in terms of um, really, really important works. And also, of course, the Japanese tradition and really um, interesting sort of artistic cultures in which comics are taken seriously. And in the French context, I think part of the reason that comics are taken so seriously in France is that there's this interesting sort of avant-garde tradition in France. If we go back to, you know, even thinking about work 
coming out in the teens and the 20s and the 30s that was um, playing with drawing and the relationship of words and images and sort of visual experiment on the page. And so there's this sort of context for experimental work there. But you know, it's striking, you know, if people think about the, the most well-known graphic novels specifically in the world, often Persepolis is named as maybe, you know, the top handful of graphic novels you know, Persepolis was an international bestseller. It gets taught a lot in grade school, middle school, high school, college, graduate school, um, like Mouse. And, you know, that's a work that was first published in France. Um, it was first um, published there. It's by an Iranian exile, but she didn't publish it in Farsi. She published it in France and published it um, with L'Association, which is a very important independent French comics publisher that has given us a lot of um, really important works like um, Epileptic by the cartoonist who goes by um, David B. Um, and lots of other um, just really artistically interesting works. So there's a, there's a huge context in France for graphic novels. And of course in Japan, there is so much interesting work happening and just the diversity of genres that come out of the manga tradition in Japan is huge. And, you know, I think it's worth noting just, just quickly that the term manga isn't really a contemporary term. Um, you know, it's a term that got applied to a lot of the works on paper that early printmakers were doing, you know, even in the, the 19th century and, and even the 18th century. So this idea of doing um, images that would circulate in a popular context has a long history in Japan and I think has led to them having a really rich comics culture. And where do you think um, in terms of the comic strip, which is of course what, what Dave and I do, um, there have certainly been some classics. I know Chris Ware has talked about Peanuts and, and its influence on, on him as a cartoonist and a sort of a graphic novelist. Um, so, so where do you know sort of the, the the traditional newspaper comic strip fit into this pantheon as, as Dave referred to it? Um, so that's such a great question. And you know, I'm so glad that you brought up Charles Schultz and Peanuts. Um, so many cartoonists who I know in the graphic novel world are so indebted to Charles Schultz. And I think one of the things that Schultz shows us that's so, so, so important. So I would say, just to answer your question directly, um, works like Peanuts, very high in the, in the pantheon um, of comics in general, if we're thinking about, you know, all of the different formats of comics, is that this is a strip that's about the complexity and the emotional complexity of kids. And there were very, very few works, I think, in any medium, I mean, really any medium, um, including prose, including film, that I think get at the vulnerability of kids and yet the kind of creative possibilities of kids' worlds the way Peanuts does. I think I might be wrong about this. I think maybe there's one strip in which we see an adult in Peanuts. I think there's maybe one like big exception. A day, maybe, maybe in the later years, but. Um. Right, but by and large, this is a world, and, and this is kind of what I mean before about the complexity of kids that is, that is populated by kids themselves. It's like, it's their world. We get to see, you know, obviously a dog <laughs> and, other, and other animals participate, but it's, it's showing us um, kids' worlds from kids' point of views. And I think it's such a um, beautiful example of an important comic strip because in being like that, it's a strip that kids themselves as readers can relate to and that also adults can learn from. So, you know, it's showing us something that I think comics do well in all formats, which is being for all ages. You know, um, Spiegelman once said, you know, he used to resist the idea that Mouse was a YA book. And then he realized that there were really dumb adult readers and really smart kid readers. And so, you know, age is just a number, you know, that wasn't his phrase, age is just a number, but you know, that in a way those categories are really arbitrary. And so there's so many important works of comics that are all ages. And I think Peanuts is a perfect example of that. 
Um, but just to say one more thing about comic strips, you know, we were talking about Bechtel before. I just want to point out, you know, Alison Bechtel got her start doing comic strips specifically. Um, her Dykes to Watch Out For comic strip, which was first published in 1983. And she um, serialized and syndicated that strip for 25 years. So she's become well known as someone who does graphic memoirs, but her whole, um, you know, early artistic career um, was in comic strips and her, you know, profoundly important artistic career was in comic strips. Yeah. By the way, I wouldn't, um, uh, I, I just finished um, her latest, The Secret to Su Superhuman Strength, um, which I, if you're interested in the process of being a cartoonist and a graphic novelist, like it doesn't necessarily pack the emotional punch of Fun Home. Uh -huh. It's so interesting to watch, you watch her process. You see her, she's like draw, drawing cartoons of herself. You talk about, you know, seeing, you know, Spiegelman draw the, draw the cartoon on the page. Yeah. Uh, a lot of, of that. And I really, you know, I think people could really, um, you know, who are curious about it would really enjoy that. I agree. I also think, um, you know, that book, just to be one level um, more detailed about it, it shows a lot of the struggles mm -hmm. that she's encountering to make the very book that we're reading. So yes, it, it shows her making comics, but specifically making the secret to superhuman strength and like wondering if she's going in the right direction and if she can go on and how the book changes. So you're right. I think that's a really nice window into not only the process, but um, thinking about the happy end result. Well, that's a good, you know, we could literally keep you here all day <laughs> talking about this, but that is a good segue just before we wrap up. You have an event coming up um, with Alison Bechdel. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, so I am doing a public conversation with Alison next uh, Tuesday evening. It's a public event. It's hosted by Harvard. Um, it's at 6 p.m. And I'm really excited for this event. Um, the theme is time in graphic memoir. So Allison titled our conversation, The Psychochronology of Everyday Life, Time in Graphic Memoir. Um, that's quite a mouthful. Um, but what it is, is it's, it's a reference to the title of Freud's book, The Psychopathology of Everyday Life. Um, so people may know that Alison Bechtel is intensely interested in psychoanalysis <laughs> and in thinking about um, uh, specifically family relationships in the context of psychoanalysis. Now, I met Allison when I interviewed her back in 2006 for a feature that I wrote about her in the Village Voice. And remember when I mentioned that the most deathly boring thing ever is to listen to someone talk about their dissertation? So I was interviewing her for this voice story and we had a great time. I think we had a one hour interview scheduled. Um, you know, I was writing a sort of profile of her for the voice after Fun Home had come out. And, you know, I think it was two, two and a half hours that we wound up meeting. And she posted on her, on her blog that day, I was so embarrassed. I had a long, intense conversation with a woman who wrote her doctoral thesis on autobiographical comics. And I was like, oh no, I did the thing. Like I talked about my dissertation and I kept her there. Oh my gosh, it's so awful. Um, but it actually turned out that conversation to be the beginning of a long, intellectual friendship between me and Allison. So um, I, I wound up sending her that dissertation and she wound up writing to me after my story came out and we kept in touch. And then in 2012, six years after Fun Home came out, we taught a course together at the University of Chicago. And as far as I know, although I don't wanna overclaim, I think we were the first ever professor cartoonist teaching team who taught a whole term length course in which we were both in the classroom every class session. I think that's true. I don't know of anybody else um, before us who did that. And so what happened was that I taught about the history and theory of autobiography and she taught about drawing and comics. And so every class we had students do drawing exercises and she made me do them too, which was totally scary and horrifying. Um, and I made her do the reading, which she really liked to do because she's sort of like an academic herself, or at least 
certainly an intellectual. So I'm so excited about this conversation because Allison and I have been talking to each other since 2006. And so it's always just such a pleasure to be able to do an event with her. So you brought up drawing. So you are not, not, not an artist. Well, I've been really excited to get a chance to hopefully mention this to you guys, but we did do together one set of comic strips, which I will send to you just for fun. So we worked together. This is my only comics credit because I am no artist, but we worked together on a series of gag strips about the philosopher Roland Barth. <laughs> and we called it Barthes on purpose in order to be a maximally awkward as kind of a joke. And it's four um, different comic strips about four different books by Roland Barth. Yes, we have to see that. You definitely. So I will. I will send it to you just for fun. And you know, I can't imagine collaborating um, uh, with anyone as talented as Allison. So, sh so if we succeeded in being even slightly funny, trying to do gag strips about a philosopher, <laughs> it's all it's all Allison's um, <laughs> Allison's c contribution there. <laughs> That's very, very modest of you. So, if people are interested in uh, in taking part or or um, seeing this event, how can they find it? Um, so there is um, a free sign up through the Harvard Mahindra Center for the Humanities website. Um, so it's a Zoom link. It's free to register. Um, obviously, it's a public free event, but you do need to register. Um, so anyone who's interested can go to the website again of the Mahindra Humanities Center at Harvard. Yes, and we will have a link to that on our um, website, petpeepscomic.com, which may be easier to remember. <laughs> that, that I've already forgotten where it's actually taking place. Um, Alas. Well, Dave, did you have any anything else before we wrap up? No, I, I think this was fantastic. I, I think it just you, you, your knowledge and your enthusiasm uh, just comes forth so well that uh, I'm just thrilled that, that you agreed to sit down with us. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank you so much, Pete. It was a real honor. No, it was a, a I, I will uh, double everything Dave said. Um, it's just so great to, to talk to somebody who's clearly so um, excited about their life's work and, you know, about something that, you know, so many people just find, find so interesting and, that, and it's that there are so many levels to. Well, thank you. This is, this is putting my February off to a really good start to be able to talk comics um, with you two on a, on a sort of um, overcast Tuesday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> exactly. That's great first. So you're, you're putting my month off on a good foot. Thank yeah. you both so much. Definitely, uh, February uh, can be rough. Start. <laughs> well, everybody, thank you so much uh, for joining in to listen to our conversation with Hillary Shute. Um, we will be back, hopefully, in another month or so with our next guest. Check on petpeevescomic.com, where, as I mentioned earlier, you could sign up for our newsletter and get news about our upcoming podcasts, our upcoming books, our latest strips, and all sorts of other fun stuff. Uh, Dave, Hillary, thank you again, and we'll see you all next time. Take care. Thank you. Bye.